Um, as you all probably know, um, Meredith and I and the babies took nine days up in New England, and it was awesome. And uh, <laughs> was that Paul? <laughs> hey, Paul. What's up? <laughs> Uh, it was a it was a wonderful trip and uh, and 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 I wanted to share a little bit with you. Um, I wanted I, I know I put a couple of the pictures up on Facebook, but I didn't put all of them. But I want to share the trip with you because it was a beautiful time, and I wanted to uh, experience it with you. Um, before I get into the trip, I want to tell you that normally what I will do is I kind of uh, get to the section of the Bible that we're going to be preaching on, like the main text for the night, and then. We'll read it and then kind of support and explain all that with other scripture. Scripture, interpreting scripture is the way to go. Uh, but tonight I'm going to just do a little bit different. Tonight we're going to start in a couple other places and then kind of land the plane at the end in Romans chapter 9. Do you know what I'm saying? So I'm going to talk about a lot of things. Then Romans chapter 9 is kind of like the final punch to the whole thing. So, so you, you can turn there if you want to Romans chapter 9, but first and foremost, I want to lead you to two places before I get into Sharon, just to put your finger in your Bible, just so you have it ready when we want to read it, and the pages will be up on the screen, but 2 Peter chapter 1 and Philippians chapter 1. You can just kind of go there, and uh, while you're going there, I just want to kind of take a moment and explain to you what I saw in Sharon, what we did there. So I got a couple of pictures. I'll be able to see them here. You can see them here. If you could just bring up the first one, Mark, that would be awesome. And you might want to dim the lights a little bit just because I want you to be able to see the details. Um, Sharon, Massachusetts, uh, it's crown jewel of Sharon, Massachusetts, is this lake called Lake Massapog. Um, it's a beautiful lake. The foliage was all around it. It's about a three and a half mile walk around the lake. It's a beautiful sight. We spent some time walking down there. You can't really see this little dot on that panorama, and it's uh, Jameson walking down the beach, but it's an absolutely beautiful place. Way back in the day, like when this church was built in the, early, in the 1800s, everyone would flock to Sharon, Massachusetts. That was a resort area. And people would flock there from all over the country to go. And there's a place called the Sapphire Manor. And there's a community center there uh, along the lake. And people would go there. And those were resorts. And you'd go and you'd sail there. You know, you'd go in little sailboats and hike through the woods and all that kind of stuff. Just a beautiful, beautiful town uh, of Sharon, Massachusetts. I loved it. The, the foliage was booming. Every day except for one was just like what we had out here today, although it was a little bit cooler. It was like 65 to 70, no clouds. The leaves were just bright orange and red and yellow, and I did my best to take pictures, but the pictures don't do justice because in the pictures, you can't see the you know what I mean? I mean? It looks like it's snowing leaves. And you can't, in the picture, you can't hear the of the leaves. And so it doesn't do it any justice, but I wanted to share some with you. Go ahead to the next one. Uh, that there is, uh, we went to uh, a place called Blue Hill. I might have mentioned it to you the last time we went, but Blue Hill is in the next town over Canton, and it's a, it's a, hu it's a big hill for that area. It's not a mountain by any means. It's a one-mile hike up, and it's really neat. We, we went with the babies, and we didn't hike, but there's a service road, but it's one mile exactly, and it's, it's like this, and Jameson, she, she's a little trooper, man. She, got, she went the whole way. She went the whole way up, all the way to the top, and then collapsed in the, in the stroller and just slept all the way back down. It was awesome. But it was a beautiful, beautiful sight. Um, but we went there. That, that hill there, uh, Great Blue Hill, is, uh, there, was a, there was a piece of land there. There's a farm right there next to it. Just really, really beautiful. They ski down that hill. I think we got a picture there, too. If you go, uh, go forward a little bit, I think there's a, a picture of the ski, the ski slope. Of course, it's not being used right now, but... Um, can you go to the next one? I don't know. That's okay. Um, one of the other things that we did there was a place called Borderland State Park. Borderland State Park is in the, is in the next town in the opposite direction of Sharon in a town called Easton. Um, well, we went there and 
when we walked through this place, it's just a, a, it's, it's so beautiful, natural, that field you saw where you come around a bend and, and all of a sudden it opens up and that's all you see is this field wrapped in foliage and these hay bales. It was just like a postcard. That's what it's like. But that, yeah, that, there it is right there. You can see the sun kind of coming through the tree. I mean, it's just absolutely amazing. It was absolutely amazing. Um, but that next picture there was from up on the hill. That picture is a picture of my beautiful wife and yeah, put that back up, please. And she looks like a Lilliputian up there. It's a big, it's a big hill, and, a, and it's actual size. That's her, but she's teeny. But, uh, but that, it, and it's hard to tell from this picture, but when you're up there on top of the hill, you can kind of see out over all the surrounding area. Much of Massachusetts can be seen in all the, the little uh, sections of trees. It's weird because there will be some sections that are full of foliage and some sections that are green. It seems to be random, but the contrast, it's absolutely beautiful. So we climbed up that hill. That was a good time. Go on to the next one, please. Um, that's the field. And, we've, and of course the kids were playing and, and they were climbing on top of the hay bales and Meredith caught Jameson just at the right time. She just snapped the film and she was jumping off. You can see her hair fluffy and she was jumping off there. Just a, just a beautiful sight. Go ahead to the next one. Uh, that's also in Borderland. Uh, there's a beautiful lake right there and I just kind of caught my little family sitting there on the bench. It was kind of cute. That's just a shameless plug because God is good. So yeah, go to the next one, please. Okay, so let me tell you about this place here. So as many of you know, if not all of you know, I got the opportunity to preach in my hometown for the first time ever, a little church called Hope Church. It was probably 25, 30 people. I have to sneeze. And uh, thank you. <laughs> ah, woo. Um, so anyway, so I get to preach in this, in this church. And... In advance, the day before, I got to, I got to Sharon and I, and I met with the preacher. And, and we, I want, I, want, I, want Sharon, I want something to happen in my hometown, right? I'm going to have to share this with you. I want something to happen in my hometown. That's my hometown, right? And so I want something to happen there. And so I'm there and I got to preach this time. I'm like, okay, maybe I can help do something, right? So I'm there. And I, and I met with the preacher the day before. And we went to Dunkin' Donuts. And we're sitting there talking. And, and, and I've, I was talked out. I'm like, listen, Phil, can we please just go outside? It's beautiful. Please, let's go outside and talk. So can we just go somewhere quiet? So he, was, he wanted to go to a place where no one could hear what we could say because he he's puking about his church, you know, and all that's going on there. And so we went to this place that was secluded. Down in Sharon, Mass., there's this, this Sharon uh, Fish and Game Club. And, and you turn down this road, and it's down the middle of absolutely nothing. Nothing. In the middle of nowhere is this gun club. And, and, and that's it right there. This is the skeet shooting range. So they, they shoot the clays from high on the left, shoot them low out of there, and there's another one to the high to the right. And you can't really see it, but right over here, there's a picnic table. And so me and Philip are sitting there talking. Now, he told me he's been a member there for about 10, 12 years, and he feels like this is the place that he is to interact with non-believers. Like he's in the church like I am with you guys and you guys are believers and that's all good and we want to build you up so you know Jesus better and all that. But you got to also be involved with some people that are not Christians, right? So you can introduce them to Jesus. And so he feels like this is the place. And so he's been a member there for 10, 12 years and he knows everybody, he gets to talk to him. But he told me that he's, he's a little discouraged, although he will not quit, he's never gotten anybody from the gun club to go to his church. So he's a little bit bummed out. So anyway, we're sitting there talking. All of a sudden, here comes this uh, Crown Victoria pulls in. And out of the Crown Victoria comes this guy, and he's just built, you know? And he's got the flat top. He's probably 55, almost 60 years old, flat top, military sunglasses, smoking a thick stogie with a German shepherd. This was a guy, man. This was like G.I. Joe stepping out of a Crown Vic, right? And he walks over, and he's... He's training his German shepherd to come and go and all that stuff. It's just a man's man. And, he's like, and Philip's like, yeah, I know that guy. That's J.J. Um, McGrath. He's the new town selectman. Selectman's like uh, town commissioner here. Three people that kind of oversee and run the, 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 the town of Sharon. That's the government. He just got elected. He used to be the deputy sheriff of Sharon, Mass. He retired. He was elected. And he's really trying to pour into Sharon and make it right. There's no accountability, fiscal responsibility. It's just a nightmare, right? So he's trying to fix the city. So he, he, 
so, so, so preacher says, yeah, I've known this guy forever, and, you know, he's a good guy, but he just, oh, he's close. He comes over, and, and, and Philip introduces me. And, and so I start talking to him. So, of course, he says, hey, he's preaching at my church this weekend. So, of course, what happens to the conversation? We're not talking about Sharon and government anymore. Now we're talking about religion. I think people just feel like they have to to try to get into God's good graces. Like, well, here's the pastor guys. You know, maybe the, God will like me if I start talking about him, you know? Sorry. So we start talking about this, right? And he's, and he's pouring out. He says, listen, I'm not Christian. I'm not this. I'm not that. I grew up going to Our Lady of Sorrows, the Catholic Church, Father Bullock, all that there on Cottage Street. And I know the church well. And, 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 but I just, I couldn't believe some of the stuff that they teach. And then some people tell me this about that and this about that. And I'm hearing all these different things. And I'm not Christian. I'm not Catholic. I'm not. And I, so I, you know what I did? I just started getting these books. And I started reading. And I started trying to figure out what really is the truth. And he starts pouring out what he believes. And I'm just sitting there. And he rambles on for about 10 minutes. I looked at him, I said, with all due respect, I know that you don't know me, but do you realize that you're a Christian? You just don't know it? Because everything you're telling me is everything that's in that book. Nobody's ever taught you that that's really what Jesus is. Right there, what you're telling me. He had some things, he was a little, but you know what I'm saying? The big, it was good. He goes, you know what? You're preaching this weekend? I think I might go. So, like, Okay. How many people have you invited to church that said they were going to come? Yes. Yeah. Are they here tonight? Yes. No. Well, we all got one. Woo! Yes. Huge win. Huge win, right? Huge win. Uh, apparently, this girl comes to my house all the time. I don't even know who she is. It's awesome. Add it to the list. Her picture will be up on the wall next week, too. So, so, so here's the thing. So, so I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Sunday morning comes. He shows up. He shows up. 12 years he's been asking people to come to church and no one's ever come. He shows up, he sits in the back row. And the first thing the preacher man says before the service goes, he comes up to me. Did you see who's here? He's like so excited. He's like, yeah, I see who's there. So I, I got done. The service went awesome. They were great people. It was great. I got home to, to, to Central Florida. The first order of business was get on Facebook. Let's find this guy. So I find him, and I wrote him a message, and I said, pleased to meet you, da 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 da, -da. Instantly, he writes me back. He didn't have Facebook, but his daughter told him, if you're going to run for government, you need a Facebook account. So he opens up a Facebook account. Well, I didn't think he'd answer me back that quick, because he's like new to this, but he answered me right back. Nice to meet you, too. Your passion was inspiring. I looked up the verses that you said, and now I'm inspired. I'm going to read the Bible. Amen. Huge victory. Huge victory. Listen, he's got massive influence in Sharon, too. He's the new selectman of town. He knows everybody in that town. Man, if he could just get a, mm, if he could just get a grip on, on God's word, man, it would be awesome. It would be awesome. So anyway, that's that. If you, can you go on? I don't know what's next. Okay, I spent a lot of time in the cemetery. It's beautiful. I've never seen more life where there's so much death. Yeah. I've been to churches, no, I'm nine. Not here, not here, right? Spent a lot of time in the cemetery. And um, I got to tell you, one of the things that, uh, that I experienced this week was, was really, really wonderful. I want to just share it with you. Come up my road, and you come to the cemetery right here. Um, right where that is, there's a grave to the left that was from 1754. I mean, old, old, right? The first lady to ever fight in an American army, the Revolutionary War, was Deborah Sampson. She dressed up like a man, cut her hair. And if you look, see the big tree? Just to the right, there's like two gravestones, two, three. The biggest one in the middle, that's where she's buried. It's a big thing there in Sharon, right? But anyway, you come up to the cemetery, there's a big rock wall. It's been there for a million years. So on Saturday night before the message on Sunday, I got, I, it was about 9 o'clock at night, I said, honey, I'm just going to go and just spend some time alone with God, and I'm going to study and get ready. So I went up there about 9 o'clock at night, and there's a, there's a street light right by the rock wall, and I could see. So I went up over the rock wall to the tree, and I faced the cemetery. It was still kind of light out there. And so, I guess it wasn't 9 o'clock. It was probably, I guess, maybe 8 or something. And so I'm, I'm looking. I'm sitting with my back to the streets. And so I'm up against the tree looking into the graveyard. And I'm sitting there, 
And all of a sudden it just dawned on me. Like I don't hear the audible voice of God. But it was just one of those things. You know, you just feel like he's talking to you. And I just, I'm like, so I start talking to him. I'm like, God, why is it for 45 years you've brought me back to this? And it's the same thing. It never changes. And it just hit me that this stuff behind me that I'm not looking at, always changing. Always, our culture is always changing. People are always changing. But this, his creation, like this was like him and this was the world. And I had my back to it and I was like, thank you. And I was reminded about just how consistent and steady and long-suffering and, and persevering and consistent God is. And so I just commend that to you, and I, and I would ask that you would do that sometimes. You just get out. We were praying the other day. I, sorry to, to put you on the spot, but, but Jessica was saying, I want to have the awe. Where's my awe? And she was pouring out to God, I want awe. Listen, you want awe, get out into his creation. How can you see, how can you have awe when you're sitting in a cubicle? How can you have awe when you're sitting in the car all day? How can you have awe when you're in meeting after meeting? You gotta get out and you gotta see what he's done, man. You get into a place like that, there's awe, man. It's amazing to see what he's done. So if you wanna have that just stir inside of you, I was so excited and I wasn't doing anything except sitting against a tree. And I was like, oh, it was amazing. Amazing beauty. Can you go on? I don't even know what's next. That's another view, just awesome picture, that's all. But there's all these graves are all from the 17, 1800s. All the way up to today, there's people on the other end, which would probably be over here, where the people, it's kind of scary too, because you start thinking about your mortality, because I've noticed on the good side, on the new side of the cemetery, I've seen a lot of people that I know, their parents. It's kind of creeping in on me now, you know what I mean? It's getting close to me. And so you start thinking about your mortality, and that was a good refreshment for me to be thinking about that, and my life, and what I'm gonna do with the rest of my life, because it's getting close, it's getting close. <laughs> So I'm going through, can you go to the next one? So I'm going through the, the cemetery and I'm looking at all these gravestones and all. Now you guys have all been to a cemetery, I'm sure. You look at these graves, some of them are very grandiose with their big columns and, you know, I don't even know, they look like the Washington Monument. And some of them are pretty, just average, about the size of a chair, just, you know, like this, on a block, just has the name and on the back it has your full name, when you were born and when you died. Some of them get fancy, there's a little lamb on the top, there's a scripture verse. Some of them have a little, a little saying that they maybe used to say all the time and they want to be remembered by it. Some of them are really, really fancy. Some of them, have, obviously these people had some cash and so they've got an area for their family and they've got a big monument in the middle of it that's super tall and super big and it's got all the names of their whole family around it, and they've got an area, you know, it's bigger than this here, and it's got rock wall around it, and every single person that's on the monument has their own gravestone with their own name on it and their own little area, and it's really, really fancy. That's cool. But as I was walking through the cemetery, and I've been, I'm 45 years old. I've been gone for a long time, but I've been at that cemetery a lot. Every time I go home, I hang out there. It's where I hang out with God. But I was going through the cemetery, and for the first time ever, I stumbled upon that, which you see in the picture. It was just a brick. All these gravestones all around. But here was this. This is in the old section, back in the 1700s. There's a brick, and that's it. And I started, I stopped. It was someone's gravestone. And over the years it had broken, someone must have stepped on it or whatever, I don't know what happened. But I, start, I actually stopped and I was thinking about this grave and who it represented. And I don't know who it is. I mean, you can put the lights on now, please. I don't know who it is that that represents, whether it's a man or a woman, whether they died when they were 15 years old or they lived to 80 years old. I, I, I don't know. I, I suppose if I went to the, the government there in Sharon, maybe if I dug into the archives, maybe I could find some information on this guy, this brick. But I don't know. And I started thinking about this 
person, whoever it may be, and it's just a uh, you know, hypothetical, we don't know, we could just make up in our own mind who this person might be, but certainly that person, if they lived any amount of years, more than 10 or 12, then they're just like us. They have hopes and they have dreams and aspirations. Maybe they have children. Maybe they have problems. Think about our life just over the last 10 years, just over the last 10 years of your life, which is but a, but a, but a moment. All the things that make up your life, the decisions on what clothing to wear today, uh, the relational issues with your spouse, your family, your work, how am I going to pay this bill, will the car start, what color to paint the house, every single thing, should I go to college, should I have this career, maybe this person, where they were going to be a farmer, maybe they had a trade, maybe, I don't know, maybe they, were, maybe they were a slave and they were in bond, I don't have any idea, but just think for a moment. All of the things that this person had that made up who they were. They were just like you. But all of this, and just imagine it if you will, if you could just envision it, all the different situations and circumstances and items that they owned and dreams that they had and all the things that make up you and all the things that made up that person and funnel it all down and now they're but a brick. That's it. That is what they are. That's what going to happen to you too. One of these days, you may have a fancy headstone. You may have a little thing like that. But at the end of the day, there's, there's a day that's coming and you will be but a brick. And that's it. And I, so, so I was thinking about this guy, wondering, like, I know nothing about this person. Isn't that kind of sad? That this person lived a life, and, and yet, even in my own home, like, I know nothing. Who, no one knows anything about this person. That's it. That's all they are now is a brick on the ground. There's no name on it. There's no wish list, there's no bucket list, there's no, there's no resume of what they have done. There's nothing. It's just a brick. And I don't want that for you, and I certainly don't want that for me. I want our lives to have some purpose. And we've been talking about the gospel. And I think that tonight what I'd like to do for you is I'd like to show you some people in scripture that responded well to the gospel so their life is not a brick this guy was a couple hundred years ago in the brick these people were thousands of years ago and we're still talking about them tonight in America 2,000 years later do me a favor and open up your Bible like I said to 2nd Peter chapter 1 you know that Peter and Paul are the granddaddies of the church, right? These are the big, big time names. These are, the, these are the leaders of the church. These are big. Peter and Paul, that's like, it doesn't get any bigger than these two guys, right? Would you all agree? So we're going to look at them for a moment and see how they responded. See what their life is like. Because I don't want your life, and I certainly don't want my life to end up to just be but a brick. I want my message to linger. I want people to know that I lived. I want purpose in my life. I want to have some meaning. I didn't want to just be born one day back in March 28, 1969, to just be born, live a few, a few years, make a few bucks, have a few kids, and croak, like, and be a brick. Is anyone in for that? Because I certainly am not. So let's read this here. This is, this is a little bit different response. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 14. Let's see what God's word has to say for us. It says, For our Lord Jesus Christ has shown me, this Peter, shown me that I must soon leave this earthly life. So he's going to be a brick soon, right? And he's been fortunate enough to be told by God that your day is coming soon. So now out of response to this, what does Peter do? He says again, if I could read it. 
For our Lord Jesus Christ has shown me that I must soon leave this earthly life. So I will work hard to make sure you, talking to the people, you always remember these things after I am gone. Now without venturing too much into this one before we get into the next uh, couple of verses, what's he saying? He's saying that my life right now will show that it had meaning if the message that I carry now lingers beyond my time here. That what happened, if I pour my life into you and you take the message that I was passionate about, I wanted to pass on to you, and you go ahead and you pass it on to generation after generation, then my life had meaning. That's what it means to live. Here's, now here's Paul. Philippians chapter one. Peter and now Paul. Philippians chapter 1, verse 20. You there? Okay. Sorry about the microphone, guys. Okay, this is what Paul says. For I fully expect and hope. That's kind of a weird thing for Paul to say because hope here in the Bible is not, man, I hope it doesn't rain. Hope is I've seen what you've done. I see the end. I know what you're going to do. I have confident expectation that something's going to happen. So I fully expect and I fully expect. So what does that mean? He fully expects. You get it? I fully expect and I fully expect that I will never be ashamed. So in other words, he's going to do exactly what God's told him to do and it's going to work out well. But that I will continue to be bold for Christ as I have been in the past. And I trust that my life will bring honor to Christ whether I live or die. For me, living means living for Christ and dying is even better. But if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ so I really don't know which is better. And he goes on to say, if I die, then the next thing that's gonna happen to me is I'm gonna be with Jesus, right? That's gonna be awesome for himself. But look what he says. He says, I'm torn between these things because I want to be with Christ, which would be far better for me, but, but, but for your sake, see, for all of you, for all of you, it is better that I continue to live. Why? Fruitful work for Christ in you. More important than what benefits me is what benefits you, right? What benefits you. Knowing this, I am convinced that I will remain alive. Why? To, to gather for myself, to bless myself, to help myself. No. So I can continue to help all of you grow and experience the joy of your faith. I say that Paul and Peter are saying the same exact thing. That they're living here right now, that whether they live to, today or die today or whenever it is, that while they're here, that their life is for one reason, and that's to be fruitful work for Christ, to bring people to Christ so that those that know Christ already would know him even better. That's what they're pouring their life into. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. This is another reference to death. This is Paul again. He's saying, as for me... My life has already been poured out as an offering to God. My life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. He's about to be a brick. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me. The crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all, raise your hand, for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. So what, is he, what are these three verses saying? He's saying that my life here now is for one reason. It's not to accumulate things for myself, self-indulgence, pleasing me, blessing me, helping me, that I'm to be happy, right? My life is to be spent pouring out all that I have in response to the gospel to you so that you would know and that you would love. And I'm not here to gather things. The grand prize of my life is not to acquire the things the world offers me. The grand prize of my life, Paul says, is not this stuff, but I can put all that stuff aside because the grand prize of my life is when I finally meet Jesus and he says, attaboy. 
or whatever else he might say, well done, my good and faithful servant, whatever it is, whether you get there and you go, man, I had something to do with his salvation. She's here because I did this, and she's here because I did, and I baptized it, and oh, yes, yeah. Like, that is the prize, the future prize, not the present. And that's, that's these guys just going, you know what? What am I spending my life on? I'm spending it on Jesus. They're responding to the gospel is all they're doing. That's all they're doing is responding to the gospel. Let me just ask you this. In light of what you just heard, what are you spending your life on? What we spend our lives on and what we spend our resources on and what we wring out all of our energy toward should not be on self-indulgence but on fruitful work for Christ. That's why you live. That's why you live. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Listen, we got to start thinking about legacy beyond yourself, future generation, right? I don't know when the Lord comes. It could be tomorrow. It could be a hundred years. It could be a thousand. I don't know. We, go, we could talk about that. But none of us know. And so we need to be thinking about that. Let me ask you a question. What you believe now? Will your message linger longer than your life? Or will you just be the person who was born, lived, acquired some stuff, put him in the ground, the preacher lied about how great he was? Is that it? Or do you want more? I want more, man. I want more. I want more. These men, Peter and Paul, were simply responding to the gospel. They recognized that they were morally bankrupt, spiritually bankrupt. They could do nothing. Peter was a fisherman, a gritty, hardworking guy, and he realized, you know what, no matter how hard I work, because some guys think that, if I work hard, I'm good. Listen, no matter how hard I work, I will never be made right with God. And Paul, he was a, he was a, a, a biblically trained guy. He said, all the laws of God, you guys think you keep them, I keep them better than you. I speak in tongues, great. nothing, it doesn't matter. I consider it all dung, garbage, trash compared to the surpassing knowledge of knowing Christ as my Lord. They just realized they were absolutely bankrupt in every way. They could not be made right with, with God unless Jesus Christ had come and paid their penalty on the cross and they accepted it and so they're, they're thrilled with that and so they're just responding to that thing. And they're like, man, thank you for, for saving me. And out of thankfulness of being saved, they respond with their life by going all in, fruitful work for Christ, doing everything I can that people would know you and love you. They were fully aware of what they've been saved from. They were fully aware of what they've been saved from. Not only were they saved from hell, but they were saved from the pressure of trying to work their way into heaven. They were, re they were saved from the pressure of trying to, to, to accomplish all these religious rules to get into heaven. That's what these two guys came from. And they're released from that, and they're overwhelmed with that, that although they were bankrupt by God's grace, they've been saved. And they get to spend eternity with this glorious God. And so not only were they thankful for that, and saved from that, but they also were fully aware of what they were saved to. And they were so overwhelmed with how good of the gift it was that they were like, listen, I've got to go in and do all this stuff. There's no, there's no choice. Listen, this is what Paul says. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 17 and then 16, okay? Kind of weird, but listen. Paul says this, detail. He says, I have no choice but to preach. I have no choice but to preach. Why? God gave me a sacred trust. That's what he said. God gave me a sacred trust. It's the gospel. And then verse 16, what does he say? He says, woe to me if I do not preach. Woe to me if I do not preach. So let me ask you a question. We've talked about this before. Because we don't really care so much about what Paul and Peter did. What about you, right? Can't help what Paul and Peter did. They're, they're long gone. But we can talk about you. We've talked about this before. The stuff in the Bible, is it descriptive or is it prescriptive? Is, 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 this, is this verses, these verses from 2 Peter, Philippians, 2 Timothy, and 1 Corinthians from Peter and Paul, is this like descriptive to say, man, that's what these guys did. How awesome are they, man? Those are super Christians. Or, so, so we can praise them, or is it prescriptive saying, hey, y'all, this is what you're supposed to do. 
Don't praise them. There were people in the Bible that tried to praise them, and they're like, no, you get up. I'm just a man. Don't you dare praise me. I'm nothing. And this is not the high watermark of Christianity. This is the standard. Listen, this is the standard of Christianity. Okay, this is the standard of Christianity. This is not descriptive. I would venture to tell you that it's absolutely prescriptive, and I'll tell you why. Paul said, woe to me if I do not preach. I have no choice, for I have been given a sacred trust by God. Right? Has he given you a sacred trust? Has anyone ever taken the time to tell you that you cannot be made right with God because you're a sinner? And that you cannot have glory apart from the work of Jesus Christ on the cross? And that he's perfect? And that he loves you? And he came and he went to the cross and he was staked up there and whipped and beaten and killed and buried and resurrected so you could be saved? Has anyone ever shared that with you? If they haven't, they just did. And so you've been given a sacred trust. So I'm telling you, is it descriptive or prescriptive? Well, listen, if you take into account the Great Commission that says, go tell everybody about me, then you have to come to the conclusion that all these things that I just shared with you are absolutely prescriptive. If you've been given the sacred trust, you're just like him. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel to those. Woe to me. I have to. I have to. See, God wants to make his plea through you, Robert. Did you know that? He wants to make his plea through you. Nevin, God wants to make his plea through you. Imagine that. Little Nevin, the creator of the universe, wants to make his plea to the world through you. What's your buddy's name? Jake. Jake and Moses. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Thank you for coming. Do you know that God wants to make his plea through you? You aware of that? Michael, same thing. Andrew, same thing. Hey, John. Eddie, God wants to make his plea to the world through you. It's 100% prescriptive. You've been given a sacred trust. And woe to you if you do not preach. I'm glad that this is mechanical error, not that you brought beans. I was on a good roll there. I just totally ruined that, didn't I? Yeah, sorry. I'm a mess. I'm a mess. Listen. L listen up, listen up. It is simply excuse to exclude yourself from this because of some shyness or some weakness that you think you have. It is excuse to exclude yourself from this. If you have been given the sacred trust, if you know the gospel, if you understand what God has done for you, then you have, I hate to say it, but you have a loving uh, gratitude, thankfulness, whatever you want to call it, but you have an obedience, call it what it is. You have an obedience. You must, you're obligated. That's your job. That's your job to share with the world. He's trying to make his plea through you. Now Paul tells this. He says to the church in, in Corinth, I don't know how many people were in the church in Corinth. I don't know if there's any biblical scholars in here that might know how many people attended the church in Corinth, but there was a city. And it wasn't like this now where there's a church in every corner. There was basically one church in the town. And you went, and you sort of behaved yourself because if you didn't, boop, right? They were pretty strict back then. But he told the church in Corinth, no matter how many people were there, he said, follow me as I follow Christ. Now, I don't know how many people are there. And I don't know that he knows all of them. If it was a big church in a city that had a lot of people in it, certainly he didn't know everybody. But he did say, follow me as I follow Christ. So there again, prescriptive, right? He's saying, woe to me if I don't preach. I've been given a sacred trust, so I have to go tell everybody, follow me. Do as I do, right? So who's off the hook here? No one better put up the hand. No one's off the hook. Follow me as I follow Christ. Well, what, what's Christ do? He's mimicking. He's, he's copying Christ, right? Christ what? He lays down his life. Willingly lays down his life for sinners. 
Not that he didn't know, but certainly they didn't know him. I never, I've never met Jesus like that, right? But he laid his life down for me, right? It says in the scriptures that he endured the cross, disregarding its shame because of the joy awaiting him, which we've talked about in weeks prior. The joy awaiting him was you. He didn't need this. He was already God, and he still would be if you weren't there. He did it because you were the joy. He wanted to hang out with you. And so he, he disregards the shame and the pain of the cross, willingly laying down his life for sinners. And Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. And so that's why he's all in, Paul, just like Jesus. And if, if, if the Bible is true, Genesis tells us that we were created in his image to be like him. And in Romans 8 it says that we were, we were chosen and called by God to be specifically like his son. So if that's true, and Jesus willingly lays down his life, then what does that mean? Then we have to, listen, we have to step into the chaos that's out there. We have to step into the chaos that's out there. Because Jesus did, and Paul did, and Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ, and Jesus himself said, Lay, pick up your cross and follow me, that's what we got to do. Now, I don't know what it looks like to step into the chaos. Like, I, I, I wish I was that guy that like, could stand up here, this amazing church leader, and say, you know what? Here's a five-step program. I know exactly in the detail of what we have to do daily, every day. This is what we do on Monday. This is what we do on Tuesday. This is what we do. And we do it this way, and before you know it, the whole town's saved. Woo! record book. We're going to go, they're going to write a, a, an extra chapter in Hebrews and put us in there. Right? That, that's what's going to happen. Listen, but I'm not that guy. I'm not, nobody's that guy. If you move and you go to another church and, you, and that guy's up there, run. Run. Okay? I'm not that guy. But listen, it doesn't even matter how it gets done. The process by you must be secondary to the priorities in you. That's where it starts. Because what you do will not matter much if your heart is right. Here's the thing. Most often, if not always, God wants to work in you before he'll work through you. See, it's always easy to point out the problems out there and all the sin that's running rampant out there and go, they need saving and they need saving and no, oh, I can't believe that guy. No, they need this and we need it. What about you? See, before we can be effective to change the world, you've got to let God work on you right inside. He wants to work inside of us. And when you read Scripture like this, and we argue about prescriptive and descriptive, and whether it's for me or whether it's not, and some people just, just rave about these guys of the Bible. Wow, amazing men of faith, amazing women of faith. Listen, that's for you. That's the standard. Don't call me radical. Don't call someone radical Christian. Call them the standard. You see someone go all in, don't praise that man and don't praise that woman. Emulate them, copy them, be like them. That's what Jesus called you to do. Don't praise them, be like them. See, a lot of us kind of dip a toe into the ministry of reaching the world because of the gospel and for the gospel. We kind of dip our toe in there and say, well, you know, I've done my part. I've done, everyone has to do their little part. I've done mine. And I'm not quite sure if that's what God wants, that everybody kind of just does their little part. Now, I think we're all supposed to be involved, but everyone is doing a little part. I think it's a mindset problem. I think, it's a, I think that there's something wrong in our heart if we think that if we just do our little part, then, then we've done what we're supposed to do. Is that what God wants of us? That all of us do a little bit. Now, you've got to draw your own conclusion, but I want to give you my position. No! Absolutely not. It's not that everyone should do a little bit. He wants the entire you. Do you understand? Enough of tithing. 10% means nothing. He wants the whole thing. He's greedy and he deserves to be. It's only greedy if you don't deserve it. And he does. So he's really not greedy, he's due, right? He said, I want everything. He said in Romans chapter 12, to give your bodies as a living sacrifice. That means lay it down, give it up for something else. Your whole body. 
everything. What part of you is not a part of your body? Everything is. We don't think about our thoughts, but you know what? Back in the Old Testament, it said if you sleep with someone out of marriage, it's adultery. Jesus comes along and blows that thing out of the water. It says if you even think about doing it, it's the same thing. The Bible says don't use any portion of your body as an instrument to do evil, but use every instrument of your body. I mean, as every portion of your body to be an instrument of doing good. He wants every single part of you. All in, these people are not high and mighty awesome Christians. They are the standard to which we must live. And I need to live up to that much better. I fail just like all of us. You remember Paul said to do as I do because I'm doing what Jesus does, remember? Follow me as I follow him. That verse is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And so when he talks, about, when he says this to these people about follow me as I follow Christ, you might say, well, what, what are you doing? I'll do it. Tell me, tell me. What, and remember, it's not about what we do necessarily. It's about what's going on in here and here. Because the program means nothing if it's not done right. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, there's someone in the church here that saw a, a, a church group out, and they all had G, Jesus t-shirts on. It's not us. I know we've got some of those, right? And so this person went to the park, and there was this big church group, all their Jesus t-shirts on, right? And this person was there with their child playing, and not one person from that church even came over to say hello. See, so the program isn't really effective if the heart is corrupt. It doesn't get anywhere. Do you know what I'm saying? And I don't want to, listen, I want this church to be filled. I'd like to do five services a weekend and have thousands of people come to Christ and, and repent of their sin and embrace Christ by faith. But listen, I don't want this place filled up with a bunch of phony garbage. I want it to be real, honest disciples of Jesus Christ, following him, hearts are being changed, lives are being changed, becoming more like the Son. That's what I want in these seats. And so it, he has to work in us before he can work through us, and in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he says, follow me as I follow Christ. This is how. It's not so much exactly what I do, but why and how. He says, um, I don't just do what is best for me. I do what is best for others so that many might be saved. So he, does, he, does he talk about the program? Does he talk about the evangelism program that we're going to use? I would just say that no matter what I'm doing, I do know this, whether it's knocking on doors, having a picnic, playing, whatever it is, whatever thing we're doing, he's not doing it with an attitude of how can this benefit me? He's always doing it, how could it benefit others? Down with the me and up with the we, all the time. You see, everything that he does, everything that he does. Down with the me, up with the we. You want another one? Anyone? Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Go there. You're robbing yourself if you don't pick up a Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19. Okay, here, here's what it says. Even though, and this is Paul writing again, even though I'm a free man with no master. Now listen, who's free in here? Who, who has somebody in their life that just says, this is what you must do all the time. If you don't, I'll whip and beat you. You'll be punished. Does anyone have that? If you're thinking about your wife, oh. She... I was going to say, if you're thinking about your wife, you need to drag and drop it into the recycle bin. He said it. I don't know if you're tough or just plain old stupid. <laughs> she knows where you sleep and she has access to the knife drawer. You know that, right? Yeah. She'll use it. Yeah. Okay, so all of us are free, right? We can, if, if, if anyone wanted to right now, like I know your finances might not be able to say you could, but like you could, in theory, get in your car and drive to Denver right now, right? You could. You could, you could drive to Texas right now. Who could tell you no? Right? You could. Okay, so we're free. We can make choices to do things that we want to do. So we're all in this, right? He says, even though I am a free man with no master, I have become a slave to all people. To Why? To bring many to Christ. And he goes on the list. When I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew. To bring the Jews to Christ. 
When I was with those who followed the Jewish law, I too lived under the law, even though I am not subject to the law. I did this so I could bring to Christ those who are under the law. When I am with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from the law so I can bring them to Christ. But I do not ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ. When I am with, he goes on. When I am with those who are weak, I share in their weakness. For, why? For I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with, listen, everyone doing everything. You've got to say everything, please. Everything. everything I can to save some. I do everything. Say it again. Come on now. Come on, revolution. Everything. Everything, everything to spread the good news, that's the gospel, and share in its blessings. So what Paul's saying here is that life as a Christian is not boring. You don't just hang around in the church all day like an old nun back in the day, right? You get out there. You meet with people. He says, look, and I'm with a whole bunch of different types of people. I don't just sit in my little convent all day. I'm out there with different people. I'm experiencing different people. I'm experiencing different things. I'm going to different places. So, but here's the thing. You read that, right? And he says, listen, my life's not boring. I'm going after it. But he says that no matter who I'm with, no matter what I'm doing, no matter where I am, right? Variety, it's awesome, but it's not for enjoyment. No matter what situation I'm in, I'm in that situation with one purpose. What? To bring people to Christ. He says, no matter what I'm doing, no matter who I'm with, and no matter where it is, that is the sole purpose of my visit there and my involvement in that activity. That's why I'm doing it. Listen, what does that mean? That means you can go to a football game. But listen, it, Paul would go to a football game. I believe he would. But he would go there with an intention. I'm so sorry, guys. He went with an intention. He would go with an intention. He'd find someone to witness to. You're darn tootin', he would. He would find, that's all cussing you in church, sorry. Oh my lands, he would. <laughs> That's the new one on Facebook. It's going to be OML. Y'all should do it. <laughs> OML. <laughs> it's pretty bad, isn't it? Uh, no matter what he did, no matter who he's with, no matter what he was doing, it was all fruitful work for Christ. All things to bring them to Jesus. The Bible says we should consider others as more important than ourselves, right? We should consider others as more important than ourselves. And so every single thing we do is not for our own pleasure, our own indulgence, but that we should do every single thing for other people. Down with the me, up with the we. That forget what I want. They need Jesus, right? So forget what makes me happy. Let's do what makes them happy. And ultimately, their ultimate joy is going to be found as I have found in Christ. And so we're to lay down our lives all the time. We lay down our preferences. We lay down our styles. We lay down our money, our time, our schedules, our tastes, all for other people that they could know Christ. And listen, that may even be your life. Now we're here in Eustis, Florida. That doesn't happen too much. But Jesus said they're going to hate you just like they hated me. And you see what happened to them. You see what happened to Jesus. He said, follow me. He went to the cross and was murdered. Look at the, Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. Yeah, he followed Jesus too. He was killed too. And every single one of those apostles were killed. It may mean laying down your life for sure. For real. He said, foxes have dens. I have nowhere to even lay my head. I'm homeless. You want to follow me? Listen, I don't know what churches you went to before that told you that Christianity is easy. It's not easy. It's very, very difficult because it goes against everything that we want to do. We want to be selfish. We want to be greedy. We want to have sex with everybody. We want to steal their money. We want to do these things. We want to have fun, 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 fun. Please me, please me, please me. I like that. I'll have it. I like that. I'll have it. That's the way we are. And Paul's like, no, don't do any of that stuff. It goes against us completely. It is not easy. It's not easy. You may die because of it. That's what he says. You may die because you followed me. And listen, it's time to make a change. 
It's time to, 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 to change the way our hearts are so it can work through us, so we can make a difference in this world. I believe our church is called to be world changers, but he needs to change us before we can change them. It's time for us to start blowing off our hobbies and blowing off our sports and blowing off our TV and blowing off dinner out every single night and big professional possibilities. We could move here, lateral move here, and retirements and IRAs and start blowing that thing off. How about this? How about you drive a car till it has 150,000 miles? How about if we do that and stop spending our money on stuff that makes us happy? How many, don't raise your hand, how many people in this room have a higher cable bill? They pay more for their TV than they give as an offering to spread the gospel to the world. I didn't know if I should say it, but I did. Not to be mean, but to bring conviction where it's needed. That's the type of people we are as a whole in America. We'll spend hundreds of dollars for hundreds of channels of TV and the plate comes by and we back off. And meanwhile, there's people out there that desperately need to hear the gospel. And if you won't tell them, I will fund us and we'll go do it. I wish we could tell the world this thing right here, right now. We all need to hear it. We all need to hear it. But instead of doing those things, let's invest. Let's invest our time and our talent and our, and our, and our abilities and our treasures into the gospel to spread the good news to the world down with the me and up with the we that's what we need to do all of us here at our church need to do that daily dying to self out of gospel gratitude now as always the bible never ever lets you off the hook if that wasn't deep enough and 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 strong enough and a high enough bar paul's like no that's not enough that's not enough God wants more of me, and he wants more of you. And that's where we find ourselves in Romans chapter 9. You go there. He raises the prescriptive bar even higher, way higher. Chapter 9. Romans chapter 9, verse 1 through 3. He says this. With Christ as my witness, I speak with utter truthfulness, my conscience and the Holy Spirit confirm us. So right there, in just that verse, you've got got Jesus Christ, the second person of the tree, the perfect Son of God, and the Holy Spirit of God, all saying this is all true, and this great apostle Paul, who... God chose to write the Bible. Probably could trust that dude, right? Maybe. All three of them are going, I'm about to say something. True that. Okay? Pay attention. He says, with Christ as my witness, I speak with utter truthfulness. My conscience and the Holy Spirit confirm it. So it's true. My heart is filled with bitter sorrow and unending grief for my people, my Jewish brothers and sisters. I would be willing to be forever cursed, cut off from Christ, if that would save them. The the greatest gift any human being could receive, because it's the only one that lasts, is forever, right? You get forever. If If you are saved and you get to be with Jesus forever, Nothing, I mean, everything else pales in comparison. Can we agree there? I mean, when I'm not what you buy me, it's all going to rot and, and die, and it's going to be in a garage sale. You, you know what I'm saying? You could buy me this building. Eventually, the termites are going to get it. They're already working on it. Okay, so, so, so the greatest gift is this. Now, as greedy people, selfish people who we are, we love gifts, right? Amen? I love gifts. So if God gives me the gift of eternal life, awesome, I got it. I'm holding on to it. I'm not letting go of it. And Paul's like, listen, to to truly love the Lord God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength means to love other people. And he said, I I love them. I want to be just like Jesus who would willingly lay down my life for them. He says, I will give up my greatest gift. I would rot in hell forever if you guys could get saved. That is when the gospel truly penetrates a heart and you start to become like Jesus who was willing to die that you might live. 
And that's what Paul said, I would, I would, I would forego my greatest gift ever, ever, down with me and up with we. I would give up everything that I have, my most precious gift, if you would get it. Prescriptive. Because he said, follow me as I follow Christ. And Christ did the same thing. He lays down his life that you might have life. He, he accepts death that you would have life. He goes into darkness that you would be in the light. And that's exactly what Paul said, I will do just as you've done, my Jesus. I would be willing to be forever separated and wrought, forever, that they would get saved. Does he know all these people? Does, he, does Paul know all the people that are Jewish at the time? I mean, two million left Egypt. That was a long time before that. So there's a lot more when Paul's writing this. Does he know them all? Does, does, does he just say, like, you know, I'll, I'd die for the good ones. I'd, I, I'd die for the ones who tithe. But the ones who don't, uh, the ones who listen to rock and roll, I wouldn't. Because that rock and roll make you have sex and smoke weed. I'm telling you right now, I would. And I don't want that in the church. I wouldn't, I, won't, I only die for certain people. But yet Jesus said that he came and died while you were a sinner. Who would, some people would die for a good person. Jesus dies for his enemies. And Paul says, I would be willing to die forever and rot that all these people that I do not even know, that's Christianity. That's love that doesn't have any, doesn't matter about if he's nice to me. I just love him anyway. I've had to exercise that sometimes. <laughs> I love you. I'm gonna miss him. Okay, that's Christianity. That's true Christianity. There's a song that says, Jesus paid much too high a price for us to pick and choose who should come. That song gets me. Because that's, that's the church. And we're not supposed to be that way. We're supposed to be ever, we should be willing to give up our greatest gift that others would receive that amazing gift. But Paul didn't even know these people. But he was willing to die forever that these people he didn't even know would receive Christ. Well, none of us can, except for, I guess, me, can talk about our Jewish brothers. But it's still prescriptive. Who are your people? Who are your people? Is it Eustace? Is it Tavares? Is it Mount Dora? Is it the Golden Triangle? Is it Leesburg? Is it Florida? It's certainly America. We're Americans, right? So it's a high watermark. You don't have to answer it, but would you be willing to give up your relationship with God that everyone else in America would get it? Down with the me, up with the we. Got to have that mindset. It's got to change. It's got to change. Rather than pointless pursuit of temporal things. We have to change the way we live and the way we think. So the temporal things that we gather simply lead to the brick. And that's it, because it doesn't matter how much you gain. The supposedly the smartest guy that ever lived, he wrote Ecclesiastes, this King Solomon. He did what we all do times a thousand. And he gathered women, he gathered money, he gathered castles, he gathered land, he gathered gardens, he gathered wisdom, high education. He did all the things that we would pursue here on earth. And at the end of the day, just to kind of use our verbiage today, he said it's nothing but a brick. It's meaningless. It's vanity. It's nothing. I did everything. I got nothing for it but a brick. I would offer you this, that a life of purpose must, must 
come from a proper gospel response of Christ-like sacrifice. Or he gives you another choice, Pauline sacrifice, which is Christ-like sacrifice because Paul is following Christ. So we have to model our lives just like them. So listen, revolution. You got to look at me. This is, this is the important thing. This is, forget Peter, forget Paul. This is you. What are you spending your life on? Like don't blow by this moment and say, man, I wish he was done. What are you spending your life on? Are you spending your life acquiring pleasure and property and, you know, prosperity and all these fun things that make us happy and position, you know, whatever, whatever, you, whatever it is. Are you acquiring things for yourself to make, setting yourself up good, happy, I want to have fun? I mean, are you doing that or are you living in thankful obedience to the gospel? Are you living sharing the gospel, serving others aggressively? Are you doing, like Paul said, are you doing everything possible? Who in here, and you can't raise your hand, I know I can't, is doing everything possible. Every, you all said everything twice. Who's doing everything possible that they might get saved? That others would be saved? No one. No one. Nobody is. But I believe that we could. I believe we're just the riff-raff bunch that could do that. There's enough people with a spine in this church that want to go all in. But the one thing that keeps our spine from really being exercised is that we're afraid that others in our church won't be there with us. And so I'm calling you to that high mark tonight. I, I don't want you to, to look at these people anymore and go, man, these guys are amazing Christians. You know what I really want for you? And I know, I, I, the, look, Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit confirm it. I know it's true. I want, and they want, for you to look at this Bible and, and be looking in the mirror. That's what he wants. He doesn't want you to praise Paul and say how amazing he is. He wants you to look at Paul and go, yeah, I'm like that. Let's do this thing. It's there for you to live by. Are you ensuring that your message lingers longer than the 70 or 80 years that you might be here. Listen, this is, this is hard for me to say, but I'll say it. I've never been good at talking about myself, but I can honestly tell you that I desire for the entire world to be different because Moses Robbins and Revolution Church answered the high call to do everything possible laying down me and lifting up we that they might get saved. I want the world to look and see that it's different because I was here. I don't want to be a brick. I don't want somebody to walk across my grave one day and go, whatever happened to that? Yeah, well, who's that? Like that meaningless. That I just lived a good life. Had a nice car. Had a nice house. Had a nice wife. Had a nice church. I ain't going to cut it for me. I don't know if I'm alone in the room, but I don't want that. I want the world to be different. I want thousands of lives to be changed. Thousands of eternal lives to be changed because Moses Robbins lived. Anyone else? I'd lo that was a great time for every hand to go up. I'm just saying you don't have to do it. You already blew the shot. You blew the shot. We'll try again next week. But, but that was a great time. Like, that's what he wants for us. I want the world to look over and, 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 and look at Revolution Church and go, what, what is God doing over there? Right? What is he doing over there? I mean, it's crazy what's going on over there. Why is it that hundreds of people are just flocking to Christ? What, why? Wouldn't it be amazing to live in a community where Jesus Christ just invaded every nook and cranny and he and his people just pushed back darkness so far that you had to use a microscope to find any of it. 
Wouldn't that be amazing to live in a, in a culture that, that the norm was worship of Jesus and, 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 and sacrificial service of others in his name? Wouldn't that be amazing? Anyone? Come on, right? All of us want our lives to mean something. Nobody ever wanted to be born, live, and die with nothing. No legacy, no nothing. And I'm sure that the guy who is a brick, I'm sure he felt the same way, right? I don't want to be that guy. Does anyone want to be that guy? I certainly don't want to be that guy. So we change. 